I saw Jesus crucified. I spoke to him as he died. I saw him in his struggle. I watched as he breathed his last breath and when he stopped breathing, I lost my breath too. The one who walked on water is no more. The one who fed 5,000 is now food for the worms and if he has been defeated, what does that mean for me? I thought that he would be the king who would rise up and rule our nation. I thought that we were the ones to bring truth and revelation, but it turns out we were wrong. I mean, maybe we imagined this all along. As I watched his body taken down from the cross, I saw my friend was gone. and He was the one who found me. How could this be? He must have gone before his time. It must have been too soon. It must have been an illusion or a dream. He can't be in a tomb. I can't come to grips with the thought that the man who claimed to be I am was slain by the hands of men. And then she burst through the door. Our friend Mary, she said, someone had taken the body of the Lord. So we ran to the tomb, only to find an empty room. And the stone was rolled away. I looked on the floor and I saw his clothes. And that's when I knew he rose. Jesus is alive. He did walk on water. He did feed the 5,000. He did raise Lazarus from the dead and heal thousands. He did make the wine. He did talk to God. He did pray for those who put him on the cross and he raised back to life. Just like Lazarus, except for he would never die again. Jesus took death, nails in his hands, nails in his feet, a crown of thorns on his head for you. He laid his life down and he took it back again. Jesus is alive.
Let's worship him this morning. There is salvation in no other name, no other person than the name and person of Jesus. He is not dead. He is risen indeed. And we worship him not on the cross, not in the grave, but risen and exalted today. Can we celebrate Jesus in this place? This is why we're here this morning, right? We're here to worship and celebrate Jesus. The enemy thought he won. The enemy thought he had it taken care of, but Jesus rose again. You're who we worship today, Father. Jesus, you're who we're celebrating today. And let's sing that chorus one more time, church. Hallelujah. Come on, sing it out today. You're declaring the truth of God's word. say thank you Jesus thank you for every person in this room today Lord we know they're not here by accident but you drew them here this morning you set this time aside you ordained this time for us so Lord we gather to celebrate you today we love you we honor you we magnify you in all things in Jesus name church you shout it Amen. Let's celebrate Jesus one more time. Amen. Yes. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, Rocket Grace Warren. Happy Easter Resurrection Sunday. We are so honored you are here today. Listen, uh, we want to let you know that uh, in a moment we're going to put two minutes on the clock, and we just want you to connect with somebody, greet somebody, tell somebody they look good in their Easter attire today. Am I right? Amen. So two minutes on the clock, and we will be right back with you. Connect with somebody today. Good morning, everybody. If you can go ahead and find your seat. Happy Easter. Hello from Waves in the back over there. 
Um, if it is your first Sunday, we are so glad that you are here, or if it's been a minute, go ahead and grab that Connect card that's right in front of you in the pew, fill that out, or you can text NEW at ROG to 94000, but we are so excited to have you here on this Easter Sunday morning. Um, next up, I get to do announcements, but nice to meet you. I'm Kayla. I'm the kids ministry director. Usually I'm in that building over there. For those of you that don't know, we just moved from another building, and we were in the basement with the kids. But now, because of the noise, probably, I'm going to tell myself, we have a whole new building for kids. Today is, yeah, celebrate that. So while it is a family service today, usually on Sundays, you're going to find me and a whole crew of kids, which I'm so excited to see all my friends here today, over in that building. Um, but that to say, we are a church that celebrates family ministry together. Um, we do know that kids get noisy. Example why they gave me a whole building. I am the noisiest child there is. Um, but if you do feel like you want to take a step out, we do have multiple rooms over there that are streaming the service so that you can feel just a part of the family over there as well. Um, number two uh, is VBS because obviously I'm not the kids ministry director if I don't put my announcement up front, you know. <laughs> Um, Vacation Bible School is coming. While it is in the summer and we're like, does the sun exist in Ohio, it is coming. That will be June 21st through 23rd, and registration is coming on that website up there on the um, card that you see. Next up, we've got Youth Summer Camp. We've got a lot of opportunities coming. So if you're too old to join VBS, number one, you can volunteer. Hey. <laughs> number two, <laughs> we have Youth Summer Camp for our teens over there. Um... Third, I think, I'm going to stop counting. I didn't graduate math. It's fine. Um, we have our friend Sunday next week. So if you have friends, great job. Applause to you. Bring them back next Sunday, April 7th at 1015. If not, make a friend today, perhaps, and bring them next Sunday. Um, after service, we've got a lot going on. We've got an Easter egg hunt over there. If you didn't see it in the field, um, it is a little bit muddy. So also, we have a photo opportunity for you and your family perhaps get those pictures before the mud fight outside. Just going to put that out there. But we also have our food truck out there with some yummy treats, and we have a special visitor coming along, hopping along, really. And I think that's all. Yeah. Hey, man, give it up for Kayla this morning, the greatest kids pastor there ever was or ever hoped to be. Amen. She's going to be out there in the mud in her beautiful Easter attire with your children. Uh, so uh, have a blast over there. Amen. Well, good morning. I'm excited that you are here today uh, in all of the glory of Northeast Ohio and the weather out there. It is spring, apparently. But uh, before we get into God's word for us this morning, we're going to receive our morning tithes and our morning offering. And as always, we just uh, echo it, this moment as an expression of worship. Your giving, your generosity is an expression of worship. Listen, if this is your first time here. There is no expectation for you to give on any level. Uh, we, this is more for people who attend here regularly and call this place home. Um, and so I just want to make sure you know that today. But as you can see from the screen, we have three primary ways you can give here at this campus. Uh, we have black boxes that are on the left and right of our sanctuary doors. We also have uh, our church center app that you can utilize by just downloading on your smart device and selecting the Rock of Grace Warren campus, or you can go online to give.rockofgrace.org. And as always, we just say thank you for your generosity because, again, it is an act of worship to Jesus. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we love you today, and we thank you. We just share in everything that you are doing. Lord, we just declare that you are the risen Savior today. So, Jesus, bless this offering that your kingdom would be furthered, that you would just be seen in every way possible. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Check out this video.
Oh, man, what an exciting morning it's already been. Uh, just the worship was incredible. The energy in the room, the Easter egg. I was tempted. I'm not going to lie. If we're, if we're a transparent church, I, I had to battle some temptation this morning uh, because I know the candy that is in those eggs. And I'm not going to lie to you, I was hungry, and I, I fought it back because I, I was reminding myself that I told everybody those were just for kids. And I, I, can't, I can't break that, but it was tempting. Every time I walked by, it's like they shined at me, and I had to look at them. But I fought it. I fought it for you. Amen. Which means I'm hungry, which means I'll preach faster, so everybody's a little happier even right now from that. So let's dive into God's Word for a little while together today. What an incredible day. Like I said, it's already been Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, whatever you're comfortable saying, whatever you grew up with as a tradition. We're just excited that you're here together today. I want to share with you some thoughts. Our theme for all, all of Easter, Palm Sunday, Good Friday, and today was he is the God of the impossible, right? He is the God of the impossible. And I, I started to think about that as we were processing this series that we have been in and what that really looks like. Because the idea of impossibility is, is, is that it does not lend itself to easily being accomplished, if able to be accomplished at all, right? And here's the point this morning as we get into this. If we're going to talk about a God who can do the impossible, that he's going to have to be a pretty exceptional God, right? Because if he's just some run-of-the-mill person, if he's just some person on a page of a Bible, then really there's nothing exceptional about him, and we can't... Uh, say that he's the God of the impossible, but I believe in the next few moments, if you'll tune in, if you'll lock in, you'll begin to discover just how loving he is and just how incredibly exceptional Jesus is. Amen? So I want to turn your attention today. We're going to, we're going to come straight out of the gospel story of Jesus' life. And as you know, if, if you've ever been in church or maybe this is your first time hearing about it, whatever, uh, wherever you've been and whatever you've been uh, kind of grown up with, I want to talk to you this morning from the standpoint and from the place in the Bible story, in the God story of where Jesus is on his way to be crucified. Now, let me tell you this morning, the first point I want to make to you, and I, the, the first thing I want to talk about this morning is pain, there we go, the pain of the cross. The pain of the cross. See, the cross was the primary element of execution that the Romans used for about 500 years until it was outlawed in 4 AD by Constantine. And it was reserved for the worst uh, criminals that they had, as well as their political rivals and adversaries. And what they would do in the place of crucifixion is they would carry, the individual found guilty would carry part of their cross, and then it would get connected, and then they would be hammered into it, and they would be placed in this, in, in this case, in this context, on the, on the hill of Golgotha. For all people to see. And it stood and served as a reminder that, hey, this could also happen to you. Not a pretty, pretty picture that is painted, right? If you were here for our Good Friday service, we talked through just what Jesus went through on the cross. And the takeaway from that night, if there was anything to be remembered, was that he did it for you and for me. Right? He did it for you and for me. See, there was, like I said, there was all of these various methods of crucifixion. Prior to them crucifying somebody, in this case Jesus, it would initially start with what is called a scourging or a whipping. In Jesus' case, they used a cat of nine tails, which was designed to tear flesh, to expose the insides and bring them to the outside. It was not a pretty picture that was to be painted, and it was a reminder to those that were watching. I want to draw your attention for a few moments to Matthew chapter 27. Beginning at verse 34, it'll be on your screen. It says, they, as they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene named Simon, and they forced him to carry the cross. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. 
There they offered Jesus wine to drink mixed with gall, but after tasting it, he refused to drink it. It says that when they crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots. And sitting down, they kept watch over him there. Verse 37 says, above his head, they placed the written charge against him. This is Jesus, the king of the Jews. Two rebels were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, You who are going to destroy the temple and build it again in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the son of God. Verse 41 says, In the same way the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders mocked him. Verse 42 says, He saved others but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down from the cross, and we will believe in him. 43 says, he trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. In the same way, the rebels who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. Verse 45 says, from noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. And about three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice. Ela, Ela, Lama, Sabahashi. That's not how you say that, but Habachi. Yeah. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I told you I was hungry. When some of those standing there heard this, they said he's calling Elijah. But immediately one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a staff, and offered it to Jesus. The rest said, now leave him alone, and let's see if Elijah comes to save him. Rounding out this passage of scripture, it says, at the moment that Jesus died, the curtain of the temple was torn into from top to bottom, and the earth shook, and the rocks split, and the tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life, and they came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. It says in 454 that when the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, Surely this is, or he was, the son of God. 55 would end this that says many women were there watching from a distance. They had followed Jesus from Galilee to care for his needs and among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph and the mother of Zebedee's sons. What an interesting profound story that we have. An interesting account from the gospels of what Jesus did, what they did to him and what he had to endure. See, the cross was no picnic. It was designed, as applicably mentioned, to destroy the individual, to end the individual's life. Now, Jesus, who was guilty of nothing, went to and endured the cross for you and for me. See, we can't understand the gravity of his love until we begin to wrap our minds and our brains around just what Jesus had to endure. It wasn't fun. Jesus endured the penalty that was met for you and for me. But I want you to know something today. He chose the cross. See, the God of the universe, the God of all creation, wrapped in humanity, went to the cross. He endured the cross to pay for the sins past, present, and future. See, the reason I can make that statement to you this morning is if we go back into the gospel story a little bit sooner. We find Jesus crying out in the garden. It's late. He knows what's about to come, and he prays to God the Father and says, If it be thy will, let this cup pass from me. But then he concludes that time of prayer by saying, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. See, I need you to understand this morning that Jesus chose the cross so that we didn't have to. Amen. Jesus went to the cross so we could avoid it. Jesus paid what you and I did not have the means to pay, right? We didn't have enough in the bank account. We weren't good enough people. We weren't nice enough people. We weren't connected enough socially to buy our way out of our sin problem. 
That's just the long and short of it. You and I were born under what the Bible calls the curse of sin because our first parents screwed up in the Garden of Eden, were deceived by the enemy, the serpent, and they ate from the tree, thus entering sin into the world, sin and death. Right? And all throughout recorded history, man's chief aim has been trying to correct the problem that was brought into humanity by Adam and Eve in the garden. But what they found out was that they were incapable. We are incapable on our own of satisfying the debt that is due for the sins that we commit, right? But there's good news today. This whole morning is all about good news. How many of you like good news? Right? I love some good news. Now, I got I to gotta share a quick story with you this morning. So um, many of you know that my driving record, <laughs> amen, is not the most stellar. Um, and uh, yeah, a lot of tickets in my younger years. However, <laughs> that's right, honey. So... If you've ever driven on Route 11, there is a camera. Anybody ever been there? Mm-hmm. That, I just want to f- knock it down someday, right? That's probably illegal, uh, so don't do it. But there's a camera there, and now I have been the culprit of that camera before, and they sent a beautiful photo of my license plate <laughs> right to my house with a price tag on it. Right now, right? $132. I know. Now, I, I was told, and I don't know if this is true, so don't listen to me in this case, but I was told by a well-intentioned person that if you don't pay it, nothing can ever happen. So, I don't know if that's true or not. I'm still here, so no, the point is, is that I thought all along that We never paid it. They didn't come for me. Well, so happens that another ticket showed up at our house. Now, my wife opened the mail that day. I come home from work, and it's just sitting there on our island, and she's like, you got a ticket. I was like, wait, what? No. Upon closer inspection... When I looked back at the date, that is not my ticket. (laughs) That is my wife's ticket. And she tried to blame me for the ticket. Now, in her defense, she did not correlate the dates uh, in that moment until after I uh, so aptly pointed them out to her to remind her that, hey, everybody's got a lead foot now and again. Now, uh, she will tell you that, uh, and this is true, that our car broke down on the side of the road, taking my kids and a couple, uh, the Adams kids to school. Amen. It was cold. It was busy. I called her and said, hey, I'm sitting here on the side of the road. It's come to find out our engine blew up. Um, and I said, hey, I need you to get here as fast as possible. And she sure did. <laughs> she sure did. And that camera was all the eager to catch it. Now, in that moment, I said, it's okay. You don't have to pay it. They don't do anything. And she looked at me and said, look, I paid the other one. I just didn't tell you. (laughs) I thought that I had stuck it to the man and I got away with it all this time, right? The point is, is that sometimes good news, right, in my case, not good news that I have to pay another fine, but good news that it was not mine. Amen. That camera should be destroyed, nonetheless. This whole morning is about good news, but the good news starts from a place of pain and suffering and sacrifice. Jesus went to the cross. He endured the scourging. He endured the nails. He endured the crown and the spear. He hung there to eventually lay his life down, right? Theologian J.J. Parker talks about the uniqueness and significance of the degree of pain and torment. That he says it was not primarily all physical, however great, but instead it was spiritual and mental. Packer says that on the cross, Jesus lost all the good that he had had before. All of his sense 
of his father's presence and love, all sense of physical, mental, and spiritual well-being, all enjoyment of God and of created things, all ease and solace of friendship were taken from him, and in their place was nothing but loneliness, pain, a killing sense of human malice and callousness, and a horror of great spiritual darkness. He says the physical pain, though great for crucifixion, remains the cruelest form of judicial execution that the world has ever known, was yet only a small part of the story. Jesus' chief sufferings were mental and spiritual, and what was packed into less than 400 minutes was an eternity of agony. Agony such that each minute was an eternity in itself, as mental sufferers know that, that individual minutes can be. That's our Jesus this morning. That's the love of God this morning. Colossians chapter 2 says that when you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ and he forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. It says that he has taken it away, nailing it to the cross and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over the over them by the cross. See, the enemy thought that the cross was the death nail that he had been looking for to destroy Jesus once and for all. But you and I know the rest of the story. The cross did not end Jesus. Amen. The second thing I want to bring us to this morning as we journey into this ultimate place of good news where we start in the pain and the suffering and the agony of a God who willingly did it for you and for me is now we find him in the silence of the tomb. In the silence of the tomb. See, there's an interesting thing culturally. Westerners specifically don't like silence. Anybody find that when you're just silent, it's awkward, right? You ever been on a date with somebody and you're just staring at each other because you don't know what to say? And it feels like an eternity of time has passed only to look down at your watch and it's been like 34 seconds. It's like, oh my gosh, when can we get out of here, right? Thankfully, I've not had to date in like 14 years, amen. It came back. But there's so much uncertainty in silence. And in this context, as the disciples who had followed Jesus for three plus years, who had seen all of these miraculous signs, who had been taught by Jesus, who had seen him raise Lazarus from the dead, perform miracle after miracle, even walk on water, there's nothing. His body comes down off the cross, and they put him in a tomb. And I'm wondering this morning, maybe some of them were thinking, maybe he wasn't God. Maybe we caused this. Even in our own life, when God seems distant and far from us, maybe we even thought, maybe God's angry at us. Maybe we think, I bet I disappointed him. But can I tell you that God knows that Jesus is in the tomb, right? God the Father up in heaven, he knows Jesus is in the tomb. And, and maybe you're sitting there thinking today, well, why didn't he do something, right? Well, let me apply it to your life. Maybe God knows that your situation is bleak. That maybe your finances are not where they need to be. Your marriage is a mess. Your relationships are falling apart. And maybe you're thinking, why, God, don't you do something? I want to ask you today, what do I do when God seems silent and absent? Because the disciples, the followers of Jesus, even his own mother, had to endure this period where Jesus, seemingly lifeless in the tomb, not making noise, have to begin to put the pieces of their life back together and begin to think, well, now I have to move on. I would tell you this morning, what do I do if God seems silent and absent? You wait. You be patient, you trust, you never lose hope, you keep fighting, you draw near, you reflect, you pray. See, the waiting between the problem and the promise is what refines us so that we can contain everything that God has for us. 
See, too often we seek out things that we aren't ready for or have the maturity for and won't properly appreciate if we were to get it early, right? This is why we don't let people drive at 10 years old. I don't care how excited they seem about it. Silas is six years old, my son, and he's like, Dad, can I drive? I'm like, you can't even see over the steering wheel. Sure, back it out. It's really his ticket. It's never fun when there's silence. It leaves our mind to wander and to fill in blanks and gaps and find a solution to what somebody is thinking or what is going on. Why didn't Jesus defend himself? Why didn't he sit up in the grave immediately? Why didn't he justify it, but yet he chose to stay there for three days? See, here's the deal. Jesus knew that God would not leave him alone in the grave. And I need you to know that God will not leave you alone in your struggles. God will not leave you alone in your struggles. If I'm going to believe God's word today that says that he's never left me nor forsaken me, then I have to understand that whether he's talking or not, whether I feel him in an emotional way or not, he's present in my life. He's next to me. He's next to you this morning. Make room because he's right there. Amen? See, sometimes in your life, God will insert a Saturday between your Friday and your Sunday. Sometimes God will insert a Saturday between our Friday and our Sunday. See, Friday traditionally is what we remember as when Jesus went to the cross and hung there. Sunday is what we're celebrating today where he resurrects and he is the risen Savior King. Amen. But there's a problem. There's Saturday. What do we do with Saturday? Can I just tell you this morning that just because God is silent doesn't mean God is absent. Just because God is silent doesn't mean he is absent. Listen, understand that he is always working on your behalf, whether you see it or not, whether you feel it or not. He's always up to something. So the question then It begs the question, what was Jesus doing while he lay in the tomb and while his disciples and his followers mourned his death? Because I assure you, he was not taking a nap. What was Jesus doing? Well, according to Matthew chapter 12, verse 40 and 41, as Jesus is teaching his disciples, he hearkens back to the book of Jonah where he begins to talk about how the Son of God would spend three days in hell. Why would he go there? Is it nice this time of year? It's not. It's hotter. (laughs) Amen. Florida people. What's he doing? I'm glad you asked. History, theology, the Bible would indicate that Jesus descended into hell during this three-day period to recover the keys of death, hell, and the grave that were sacrificed in the garden when Adam and Eve sinned, and Jesus went to disrupt the party that the enemy was having. It's echoed and confirmed in Revelation chapter 1, verses 17 and 18, where Jesus declares, I have these keys. Now, here's what I want you to understand this morning. The enemy thought he won. He thought the plan had succeeded. He thought that he had finally done away with this nuisance that was Jesus. And he is elated. He is excited. They're making balloon animals in hell, partying down, having buffalo chicken dip. It's the best party snack there is, by the way. Amen. There's some agreement in the crowd. And Jesus steps into this party, and it's like, hey, remember me? You thought you got rid of me? You thought you succeeded? You thought you figured it out? You thought you won? And he says, not only did I come to uh, throw it in your face a little bit, 
but I'm going to need to collect something back from you that you took from my people. I'm going to need something back from you that you took that doesn't belong to you. I'm going to need their authority back. I'm going to need their power back. I'm going to need these keys back. Here's how I think about it. In the NFL, the Seattle Seahawks Stadium is what is widely known and agreed upon as the most ruckus, raucous, loudest, most hostile environment that anybody ever has to go play in. Apparently the decibel level gets crazy, it's nuts, I've never been there, but everybody and their mama says it's, it's like nuts, right? Here's how I think about this in terms of what Jesus did, okay? Because everybody knows that the road team in football is always at a slight disadvantage. they got to travel. they got to sleep in uncomfortable hotels at times. They're out of their rhythms. They're out of their routines. And here's how I think about this. As a Cleveland Browns fan, amen, Steelers are awful. Nonetheless, as a Cleveland Browns fan, it's, it would be like us, the Browns, before we got good, like the 2-14 and 14 Browns like the Tim Couch Browns, or like the Johnny Mansell or the Brady, all of the terrible list, okay, of Browns. You know. We've cried about it together. It's like them, it's like that team rolling into the Seattle Seahawks stadium and just throttling the Seattle Seahawks in spite of the hostile environment that they find themselves in, right? It's beautiful. Like Joe Flacco throws like 900 yards and 12 touchdowns. Should have re-signed him. Nonetheless, here we go. That's how I equate what Jesus did. Not that he's positioned in this moment as the underdog, but as he empty or enters into this hostile environment, he says, give me back what belongs to my people. See, understand this morning that although there was silence in the tomb, doesn't mean that Jesus wasn't up to something for you and for me. And in your life. I just need you to know this today. You may not always feel him. You may not always get the emotions where you sob or get excited. It does not mean that God has left you. It does not mean that he's turned his back on you. It doesn't mean that he's angry with you. It doesn't mean that he's disappointed in you. It just means that he's up to something that you aren't ready for yet. And at the appropriate time, he will bring it into your life. So what should you do? You should keep holding on. You should keep believing. You should keep praying. You should never let go. Because he's doing something. Silence makes this go nuts. But I need you to know today that God is up to something in your life. See, God has you right where he needs you. You sit right in the palm of his hand, and he loves you, and he sees you, although it may not feel like it, although he might be silent now, doesn't mean he isn't near to you. So let's continue on in the story. We have the pain of the cross. We have the silence of the tomb. And the most exciting piece about the entirety of the story is the power of the resurrection. The power of Jesus' resurrection. See, it was three days later that Jesus comes back from the dead victorious, overcoming death. Even the Apostle Paul later in history would write in Philippians 3.10 that I may know him in the power of his resurrection. See, understand that the resurrection was a powerful event. Can I also tell you that it was a historically recorded event? It's not just simply contained in pages of a Bible that Christians read, but that it is recorded history. That there is evidences and accounts of people who watched Jesus get put into the tomb only for three days to discover that this tomb is empty. Luke chapter 24, verses 1 through 8. It says, Now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, uh, uh, morning, they and a certain other woman with them came to the tomb bringing spices which they had prepared. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened as they were greatly perplexed about this, that behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. 
Then as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but he is risen. Remember, he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified. And the third day he would rise again. And then it says that they remembered his words. It was, it's interesting to me, however, that as they journeyed with Jesus for all those years, that they were not more prepared for him to, to accomplish this resurrection moment. I want you to know today that we, you and me, must prepare for God to do the impossible. I want you to understand this morning that Jesus is the God of the impossible. He not only died for you, he not only fought in hell to regain your authority and rights as his creation, but he rose again signifying that he is the God of the impossible. Maybe you're sitting there saying, Pastor Andrew, why does this matter? Not only does it validate everything Jesus said he was and claimed to be, but it shows that this Jesus has power even over death and that he can give new life. That salvation is only to be found in him. I want to give you quickly as I get ready to wrap this up, three things that you can take away from the powerful resurrection of Jesus. Jesus rose from the dead means you and I can be forgiven. Jesus accomplished everything he set out to do. He fulfilled every promise, every prophecy. He lived sinless. He endured the cross. He was obedient to the Father. And three days later, he rose again. I need you to know today that if he doesn't rise again, everything is out the window. None of it matters. You just came for an Easter egg hunt. But he rose again. He is risen today. And because he is risen today, he fulfilled everything, and he can forgive sins. He can offer new life. The second thing is you need to know is that Jesus rose from the dead in power. Right? It means that you and I can operate in the same power. Romans 8 Verse 11 would indicate that that same power that raised Jesus from the dead, guess where it dwells? Richly in you and I. The same power that raised Jesus back to life dwells richly on the inside of us. The last thing I need you to know about his resurrection is that because Jesus rose from the dead, it means you and I can have everlasting life forever. Jesus even makes this statement in John chapter 11, verse 25, after he raises Lazarus from the dead. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. That resurrection spirit is passed on to us. Worship team, if you want to come back. I told you this morning, this thing is all about good news. It didn't start out looking like it was going to be good. God even got a little silent in there for a couple days where it's like, well, I don't know what's going to happen. But boom, three days into it, he's like, I'm back. So you understand this morning, we celebrate our risen Savior. He was motivated by love. He was obedient to the Father's will. And he overcame the grave for you and for me. But why? Why would he do this? Because he wants you and me. He desires us. Romans chapter 5, verse 7. It says, for one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. 
For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Maybe even more simplified, we find in John's gospel. In chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And whosoever would believe in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Most famous verse in all of scripture. This morning, I need you to understand that you're not here by accident. In fact, there was a team of people that gathered earlier this morning that prayed over every seat because we knew people would be sitting in them. You probably saw the card that says your seat has been prayed over. That, we didn't just put that out there so we could feel, feel spiritual or like we'd accomplish. I mean, there were people that walked every one of those aisles, every one of these pews, and they prayed. We didn't know who was going to be here. We didn't know who was going to be sitting where, but we prayed that God would speak to you, that God would love on you, that you would feel his presence, that you would know beyond a shadow of a doubt that he's everything he claims he was. So I want to invite you this morning. Go ahead and stand to your feet. So you're in this place today. I want to give you an invitation. I want to give you an opportunity. Do me a favor. Go ahead, close your eyes. Bow your heads. If you're in this place, you say, Pastor Andrew, after hearing this message, after being part of the worship, I know that Jesus is everything he said he was, claims to be, and I need to make him Lord and Savior of my life. See, that opportunity is extended to any who would listen and receive. The Bible actually says it like this, that today is the day of salvation. I heard it taught once that salvation is as simple as picking a, picking a coin out of somebody's extended hand. It's no strings attached. It's free. It's a gift. And you're in this place today, and maybe you've been wrestling. Maybe you felt like God was distant. Maybe you've been going through problems and challenges, and life doesn't really ever seem to make sense to you. It's like you take one step forward just to get knocked ten steps backward. And you say, maybe I need to begin a journey with Jesus. And I want to invite him into my life. I want that same resurrection power that you talked about. I want to know that there's an eternity with him. You say, Pastor Andrew, I want to make Jesus Christ Lord and Savior of my life. On the count of three, I just want you to lift your hand up. One, two, three. Let's lift that hand up today. I see that hand. You say, I want to make Jesus Lord and Savior of my life. see that hand today. A few more seconds. What you're doing is you're just saying, I know that there's a need in me. I know that there's a void in my heart that only God can fill. I've looked a lot of other places to fill it, and none of it seemed to last. It worked for a little bit, but it wasn't lasting. I need you to know today that Jesus is lasting. So if that's you, just hold that hand up for another minute, for another couple seconds. You see that hand today. We're going to pray together as a church. And if you raised your hand, I want you to pray this, but I want you to pray with some intensity. I want you to, I want you to believe every word that you're about to say. Because this is the application of faith. This is you putting faith into action. So everybody in the room, I want you to say, Jesus, Jesus. wash me, wash me. Cleanse, me, cleanse me, and forgive me of my sins. Come into my life. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. Be my closest friend. I believe you are God. You are my Savior. Help me to serve you, to know you, to live for you the rest of my life. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Here's what I need you to understand this morning. Here's what I need you to know this morning. 
The Bible says that if you prayed that and you believed it in your heart and you spoke it out of your mouth in faith, the Bible says that that's the beginnings of salvation, that Jesus has entered into your life and that you get this incredible opportunity to start a journey with him. Your eternity is taken care of. Heaven is your home. Hell is nothing to worry about. And now you get to understand and enjoy following him. Amen. We're going to sing one final song together today. It's an old, I would say it's an oldie but a goodie. But I'm, I feel old when I say that, so. <laughs> but I want you to worship one more time together. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my soul. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of celebrate today? Can we celebrate Jesus today?
Amen. Listen, in a moment, I'm going to dismiss you. We have, like uh, Kayla shared a little while ago, our food truck had some uh, spring-inspired treats out there for you. There's an egg hunt that will be starting soon. There's the photo booth in the cafe. There'll be a hop-along friend coming here in a few moments. But listen, here's the deal. If if I can have a couple of our altar workers to uh, join me down front. If you raised your hand and received Jesus today, we are so excited for you. You have no idea. Like beyond excited. It is the greatest decision that you will ever make in your entire life. I've been following Jesus since I was an 11-year-old, 10, 11-year-old boy, and it is still the greatest decision I have ever made in my entire life. But here's what we understand. We don't ever want you to have to take this journey alone. In fact, you're not supposed to take this journey alone. And so if you raised your hand and you're comfortable, if you could just find one of these prayer team members down there, they want, I want them to put a card in your hand. This is just a next steps card. It's a resource for you. It's an opportunity for you to connect back to the church for us to help connect you on your journey. And it walks you through everything that you just said yes to today. So if that's you and you, you raise your hand during our salvation call, we won't keep you long. We're not going to have a conversation with you unless you want us to. We just want to put this in your hands and we just want to celebrate with you every decision that you made to follow Jesus. Amen. Church, can we celebrate today? Yes. So just make your way down front. Grab that card. And you can head right out. Actually, you can get a front row seat. You can head out right to these doors on my left, your right. The rest of you, enjoy the rest of the festivities out there. We just say it again. Happy Resurrection Easter Sunday. We love you. Rock of Grace, have an incredible afternoon. We'll see you outside in a minute.